one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Brian Lynn has a story on an exhibition of war stories and artwork from children in Ukraine. Mario Ritter Jr. reports on a singer hoping to change Peruvian popular music. Faith Perlow has this week's Ask a Teacher about the difference between the words persons and people. Faith and I then discuss what it means to be a people pleaser. Later, we listen to a story by O. Henry called Mammon and the Archer. But first, here is Brian Lynn. An exhibition of war stories and artwork from children in Ukraine recently opened in the Netherlands. The event is being held in Amsterdam, where Anne Frank wrote her famous World War II diaries as she hid her family from Nazi occupiers. The exhibition, called War Diaries, shows the experiences of children caught in the war in Ukraine. The conflict began when Russian forces invaded the country in February 2022. Kristina Kranovska developed the idea for the show. She said it is meant to describe the pains of war through the children's eyes. Kranovska added, It strikes into the very heart of every adult to be aware of the suffering and grief that the Russian war has brought our children. The exhibition includes notes like those written by Anne Frank in the Amsterdam home where she hid with her family from the Nazis during World War II. The show shares the stories Ukrainian children have faced during the war as told in writings, photos, and video. Among those taking part was Mikola Kostenko, the boy who is now 15, spent 21 days surrounded by Russian forces in the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. Kostenko created drawings with pen and paper torn from notebooks. One of them showed the small basement where he and his family sheltered from Russian forces before they fled the city. Kostenko told the Associated Press, I put my soul into all of these pictures because this is what I lived through in Mariupol. What I saw, what I heard, so this is my experience, and this is my hope. Katya Taylor is a curator for the exhibition, meaning she helps collect the materials included in the show. She said she thinks the diaries and artwork are useful tools for helping the children deal with the harmful effects of war. Kostenko said drawing and painting helped calm him and provided a healing effect. It also was an instrument to save the emotions that I lived through, for me to remember them in the future, because it's important, he added. Ukrainian officials have estimated that more than 500 children have been killed during the war. In addition, the United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, estimates about 1.5 million Ukrainian children are at risk of depression, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and other mental health problems. The youngest diarist was ten-year-old Yehor Kravtsov, who also lived in Mariupol. In writing appearing next to the diary, he describes his dream of becoming a builder. But he said his experience living through the war changed his mind. Kratzov wrote, When we got out from the basement during the occupation, I was very hungry. I decided to become a chef to feed the whole world. I'm Brian Lynn. Lenin Tamayo is named after the leader of the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin. But he wants to revolutionize Peruvian popular music. Tamayo aims to create popular music similar to South Korean K-pop songs, but he is using Quechua, the language of the Incas. The Incas were the people who ruled western South America before the arrival of Spanish explorers. Tamayo grew up speaking Quechua at his home in Lima. His music mixes beats from Korean songs with folklore from the Andes mountain area and traditional Peruvian sounds. It appears to be popular. Tamayo has received at least four million hearts on the video social media service TikTok. Twenty-three-year-old Tamayo is not so concerned with how many people listen on social media. Instead, he hopes to bring attention to discrimination and the importance of Peru's past and those he claims as his ancestors. He told Reuters, My music had to embrace my origins strongly. The young singer observed that the voice was very important to the people of the Andes, calling it a primordial sound. And he added, the voice goes hand in hand with the language, noting that Quechua is what will define his sound. Quechua is spoken by about 10 million people in South America. It is the most widely used native language there. It is spoken not only in Peru, but also in parts of Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, and Ecuador. In school, Tamayo began listening to Korean popular music, or K-pop, which started being popularized internationally by the group BTS about ten years ago. Study of Korean culture became a way for the young singer to make like-minded friends and to deal with bullying that he said he faced because of his appearance. Tamayo told Reuters that he saw young girls listening to K-pop and watching Korean TV dramas. By trying to make friends, he thought he could get closer to Korean culture, he said. 
The result is a musical mixture that people on the Internet have called Q-pop. Tamayo's first album, Amaru, was released this month. Each song is based on Incan mythology. Ideas include Kaya Pacha, or The Living World, Uku Pacha, or The World of the Dead, and Hanan Pacha, The Heavenly Kingdom. On stage, Tamayo dances and looks like a Korean male performer, but the sound of the music is based on traditional instruments from the Peruvian mountains. Fans who recently attended a Lenin Tamayo performance were happy to take selfies and talk about the new artist. Gabriel Castro spoke to Reuters about it. He said the new music helps raise awareness among all our people, all our new generations, and the older ones, too, who are part of Peru. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between persons and people. Hello, my name is Richard. I am from Uruguay. I would like to ask you about the differences between persons and people. I learned that I have to use people as a plural of person. However, I saw that in English sometimes, they write persons as a plural instead of people. Thanks in advance, Richard. Thank you for writing to us, Richard. This is a great question. Both words are the plural form of person, but we use them in different situations. Let's explore each word further. A person is a noun, meaning an individual human. Person is in the singular form. In English, we do have a plural form of that word, which is persons. Although we do not use it much in everyday speech, the word persons is often used in law, especially when talking about missing persons or persons of interest. Police said they are seeking three persons of interest, possibly in connection with the robbery. Most often, we use the word people to mean multiple or a group of humans. It is the most common plural form of person. The word is a countable noun, and although people is defined as many humans, it is not a collective noun. Collective nouns describe many individuals who form a group. There were 50 people picking apples at the orchard. Susan enjoys being around a lot of people. We often use the word people when talking about one ethnic group or nationality. The Ukrainian people celebrate their Independence Day on August 24th. Sometimes you may see peoples with an S. We use peoples when we are talking about different ethnic groups in the same area. The peoples of the Caucasus are spread over six countries and include more than 50 ethnic groups. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Richard. 
Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. That was this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. It's great to talk with you again, Dan. This week, you look at the plural forms of the word person. That's right. Persons and people. We even looked at peoples with an S. So, Dan, I have a question for you. Are you a people pleaser? What exactly is a people pleaser? People pleaser is a compound word. To please someone means that you make them feel happy and satisfied in some way. If you are a people pleaser, you have a very intense urge or desire to please others and make them feel happy, even if it means that you put them before yourself. So that can be very negative. Often, for people who are people pleasers, it can be difficult to say no, even if the request from others seems outrageous or extreme. So I'll ask you again, Dan. Are you a people pleaser? I think so. I try to avoid conflict, so I have a tough time saying no to people sometimes. But I think as I've gotten older, I sort of care less about what people think. So it's gotten a little easier for me to be less of a people pleaser. What about you, Faith? I think I am becoming less of a people pleaser over time. I think I've experienced a lot of stress and anxiety or worries over the past few years with trying to please everyone. And I realize that I can still have empathy and care about people without the negative effects of being a people pleaser. What do you think those negative effects are? Everyone experiences things a little differently, but some of the effects can include the anxiety and stress that I mentioned before, and other things like being angry, having less self control, and hiding your own thoughts, feelings, or needs. So it is important to recognize if you are a people pleaser, so you can start to create boundaries or emotional limits with others. It is always good to establish boundaries. Thanks for sharing about this compound word, Faith. See you next time. Mammon and the Archer. Old Anthony Rockwall, who made millions of dollars by making and selling Rockwall soap, stood at the window of his large Fifth Avenue house. He was looking out at his neighbor, G. Van Shulite Suffolk Jones. His neighbor is a proud member of a proud old New York family. He came out of his door and got into a cab. He looked once, quickly as usual, at Anthony Rockwall's house. The look showed that Suffolk Jones was a very important man, while a rich soap maker was nothing. I'll have this house painted red, white, and blue next summer, said the soap king to himself. And we'll see how he likes that. And then Anthony Rockwall turned around and shouted, Mike! in a loud voice. He never used a bell to call a servant. Tell my son, he said when the servant came, to come to me before he leaves the house. When young Rockwall entered the room, the old man put down the newspaper he'd been reading. Richard, said Anthony Rockwall, what do you pay for the soap that you use? Richard had finished college six months before, and he had come home to live. He had not yet learned to understand his father. He was always being surprised. He said, Six dollars for twelve pieces. And your clothes? About sixty dollars, usually. You are a gentleman, said his father. I have heard of young men who pay twenty-four dollars for twelve pieces of soap, and more than a hundred for clothes. You have as much money to throw away as anyone else has. But what you do is reasonable, 
I myself use Rockwall soap because it is the best. When you pay more than 10 cents for a piece of soap, you're paying for a sweet, strong smell and a name. But 50 cents is good for a young man like you. You are a gentleman. People say that if a man is not a gentleman, his son can't be a gentleman. But perhaps his son's son will be a gentleman. But they're wrong. Money does it faster than that. Money has made you a gentleman. It has almost made me a gentleman. I've become very much like the two gentlemen who own the houses on each side of us. My manners are now almost as bad as theirs. But they still can't sleep at night because a soap maker lives in this house. <laughs> there are some things that money can't do, said the young man rather sadly. Don't say that, said old Anthony. Money is successful every time. I don't know anything you can't buy with it. Tell me something that money can't buy. And I want you to tell me something more. Something is wrong with you. I've seen it for two weeks. Tell me. Let me help you. In 24 hours, I could have $11 million here in my hands. Are you sick? Some people call it a sickness. Oh said Anthony. What's her name? Why don't you ask her to marry you? She would be glad to do it. You have money, you're good-looking, and you are a good boy. Your hands are clean. You have no rock wall soap on them. I haven't had a chance to ask her, said Richard. Make a chance, said Anthony. Take her for a walk in the park or walk home with her from church. You don't know the life of a rich girl, father. Every hour and minute of her time is planned. I must have her or the world is worth nothing to me. And I can't write to say I love her. I can't do that. Do you tell me, said the old man, that with all my money you can't get an hour or two of a girl's time? I've waited too long. She's going to Europe the day after tomorrow. She's going to be there two years. I'm allowed to see her alone tomorrow evening for a few minutes. She's coming to the city on a train. I'm going to meet her with a cab. Then we'll drive fast to the theater where she must meet her mother and some other people. <sighs> Do you think she would listen to me then? No. Or in the theater? No. Or after the theater? No. No, father, this is one trouble that your money can't help. We can't buy one minute of time with money. If we could, rich people would live longer. There is no hope of talking with Miss Lantry before she sails. Richard, my boy, said old Anthony, I'm glad you're not really sick. You say money won't buy time? Perhaps it won't buy all of time, but... I've seen it by some little pieces. That evening, his sister, Ellen, came to Anthony to talk about the troubles that lovers have. He told me all about it, said Brother Anthony. I told him he could have all the money he wanted. Then he began to say that money was no use to him. He said money couldn't help him. Oh, Anthony, said Ellen, I wish you wouldn't think so much of money. Money is no help for love. Love is all-powerful. If he had only spoken to her earlier, she could never say no to our Richard. But now I fear it is too late. All your gold cannot buy happiness for your son. At eight the next evening, Ellen took an old gold ring and gave it to Richard. Wear it tonight, she said. Your mother gave it to me. She asked me to give it to you when you had found the girl you loved. Young Rockwall took the ring and tried to put it on his little finger. It was too small. He put it inside his coat in a place where he thought it would be safe. And then he called for his cab. At the station he met Miss Lantry. We must not keep my mother and the others waiting, said she. To Wallach's Theatre, as fast as you can drive, said Richard to the cabbie. They rolled along 42nd Street to Broadway, and from there to 34th Street. 
Then young Richard quickly ordered the cabbie to stop. I dropped the ring, he said, getting out. It was my mother's, and I don't want to lose it. This will only take a minute. I saw where it fell. In less than a minute, he was again in the cab with the ring. But within that minute, a wagon had stopped in front of the cab. The cabbie tried to pass it on the left, but a cab was there. He tried to pass on the right, but another cab was there. He could not go back. He was caught where he was and could not move in any direction. These sudden stops of movement will happen in the city. Instead of moving along the street in their usual orderly way, all the wagons and cabs will suddenly be mixed together and stopped. Why don't you drive further? said Miss Lantry. We'll be late. Richard stood up in the cab and looked around. He saw a stream of cabs and wagons and everything else on wheels rolling toward the corner where Broadway, 6th Avenue, and 34th Street meet. They came from all directions, and more and more were rolling toward them. More and more were caught there. Drivers and cabbies shouted. Everyone on wheels in New York City seemed to be hurrying to this place. I'm very sorry, said Richard. He sat down again. We can't move. They won't get this straight for an hour. If I hadn't dropped the ring, we... Let me see the ring, said Miss Lantry. Since we really can't hurry, I don't care. I didn't want to go to the theatre. I don't like the theatre. At eleven that night, someone stopped at the door of Anthony's room. Come in, shouted Anthony. He had been reading and put down his book. It was Ellen. "'They are going to be married, Anthony,' she said. "'She has promised to marry our Richard. "'On their way to the theatre, their cab was stopped in the street. "'It was two hours before they could move again. "'Oh, Brother Anthony, don't ever talk about the power of money again. "'It was a little ring, a true love ring, "'that was the cause of our Richard finding his happiness. "'He dropped it on the street and had to get out and find it. "'and before they could continue, the cab was caught among the others. "'He told her of his love there in the cab. "'Money is nothing, Anthony. True love is everything.' "'I'm glad the boy got what he wanted,' said old Anthony. "'I told him I didn't care how much money. "'But, Brother Anthony, what could your money do?' "'Sister,' said Anthony Rockwell, "'I'm reading a book with a good story in it. It's a wild adventure story, but I like it, and I want to find what happens next. I wish you would let me go on reading. The story should end there. I wish it would. I'm sure you too wish it would end there. But we must go on to the truth. The next day, a person with red hands and a blue necktie whose name was Kelly came to Anthony Rockwall's house to see Anthony. "'That was good soap we made,' said Anthony. "'I gave you five thousand dollars yesterday.' "'I paid out three hundred dollars more of my own money,' said Kelly. "'It cost more than I expected. "'I got the cabs, most of them for five dollars, "'but anything with two horses was ten dollars. "'I had to pay most to the cops. Fifty dollars I paid to two, "'and the others twenty and twenty-five. "'But didn't it work beautifully, Mr. Rockwall? "'They were all on time.' And it was two hours before anyone could move. Thirteen hundred. There you are, Kelly, said Anthony, giving him the money. A thousand for you, and the three hundred of your own money that you had to spend. You like money, do you, Kelly? I do, said Kelly. Anthony stopped Kelly when he was at the door. Did you see, asked he, anywhere on the street yesterday, a little fat boy with no clothes on, carrying arrows? Kelly looked surprised. No, I didn't. But if he was like that with no clothes, perhaps the cops caught him. <laughs> I thought Cupid wouldn't be there, Anthony said, laughing. Goodbye, Kelly. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 